wet weather and short supply. Did you have one of those last week? No. I am. Thank you. I don't think I can see that. Again, welcome you to the Roy Branson Legacy Sabbath School class. For today, we're uh, continuing our discussion by Dr. Rodney Corker, uh, discussing brain and neuroplasticity. And so at this time, I'm just going to turn it right over to Rodney. So, Dr. Corker. Thank you, Barb. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. Just just bow our heads and we'll open with prayer. Our almighty and gracious Father, uh, life and the human body and the human brain are just full of mysteries. And uh, we got to probe around in them again this morning. And uh, our reason for doing this is to understand better how the brain is constructed and how the brain functions so that when we talk to you, we don't ask you to do things you can't do. And uh, we don't expect to do things that you haven't asked or designed us to do either, because we know that you're a fair and just God. And uh, we'd ask that you bless this uh, assembly. We thank you for that promise from the beginning that you would never leave us. And we thank you for that force that always draws us towards you and brings us to Sabbath school every, every week. And it's an immutable, incomprehensible force. Uh, and we thank you for it. We acknowledge it. So bless our ponderings this morning. And may we, at the end of this session, just gain some, one or two insights into how we're constructed and how you want us to behave. Are you sure my sister is going I was in Rotary one day and someone was praying and very quietly and someone said, I couldn't hear you. And the other person said, wasn't talking to you. <laughs> so, even if we didn't hear the one that you intended. <laughs> okay, so how I'm going to start the, this morning is I'm going to go back just for a minute or two uh, to hook up with what I talked about last week and then we're going to move forward into uh, the uh, remaining lobes of the brain and then into some critical centers that are the uh, integrative and, and constructive parts of our, uh, of our brain. Um, and so I want to come back just briefly on to the frontal lobe. There's some interesting research in the frontal lobe that also not just interests me but raises some theological questions. Now, if you look at the frontal lobe here, we know that's where insight and empathy and character and personality, uh, those crates, uh, those uh, traits are housed and they're displayed. Um, towards the bottom of this is called the, uh, the uh, uh, frontal association area. So in that frontal association area, it controls stimulus that goes into uh, the cortex where information is stored and it coordinates the information that's coming from that frontal lobe and pushes it back where it coordinates with a posterior association uh, area and then sends it down to the limbic system and other some very primary areas that we're going to take a quick look at. But the interesting thing is that the uh, research shows on the frontal lobe that, that uh, the top part here, which is the dorsal lateral side, which is the outer side, and the upper side here is different from the ventral medial side down below, down below here. There's two different tracks that go on. It's like a, it's called dual track theory. And uh, it certainly makes a lot of sense to me, and I think it's how we were designed. But this top area here, that, that is the dorsal lateral part of that frontal lobe, it is the, the kind of the cold, calculating, analytical, um, factual part of our brain. <clears throat> it's where the, you've heard the expression, the Pareto principle. That's where the Pareto principle would be housed. You know, does everyone know what the Pareto principle is? No. no. <laughs> That's the, uh, the, uh, the theory that we learned in certainly in psychology, Graham, and probably uh, other professions as well, whereby the, the greater moral good is sacrificing the few for the many. It's, it's a cold analytical calculation. So when the um, Allies were thinking to, to bomb Japan, uh, for example, there were calculations that were done how many uh, Allied soldiers would die, how many uh, uh, Japanese civilians would be killed, the total resource consumption that would go into that, that went into deciding to bomb uh, Japan. 
That is, and, so, and the other artist too, for that matter, that is a cold, calculating, parietal driven uh, 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 phenomenon. So we were taught uh, in psychology that the greater good uh, was served by saving the most amount of people, even if it meant sacrificing the few. That's the top end frame here. Now, the bottom, oops, let's go back here. <coughs> on the wrong way inside. Okay. So down here is the emotional center. You see, um, and emotional regulation is down in this area too. So that's more what we would call the heart of the frontal lobe. <coughs> so, so down here is more the instinctive, automatic emotions and feelings. Okay, so what does that mean? This would be more <coughs> kind of a basic, reflexive, but the person who lived down in this part of the brain, down the bottom, would tend to say, no, I don't believe in the parietal uh, principle. Just losing one life, sacrificing one life, is just not acceptable. We have to save everybody. And it's obscene to sacrifice the few for the many. You see? And it's more instinctive. So if you think about mother bear, you know, and mother lion, they will defend their automatically and reflexively defend their young against all comers, all assaults, until their cause is hopeless. That's the instinctive part. This other part up here is much more layered, and we develop that character in those beliefs, and they're formed as inhibitions. So when there's trauma to the brain, or if the brain is undeveloped, we have fewer inhibitions. So the traumatized brain is in a state of disinhibition and it reverts back to very primal reflexive behavior. Even in uh, a psychology we will learn that uh, developmental psychology is suppressing those reflexes, suppressing those instincts and putting a level of higher cortical function of intellectualization and conceptualization on top of those primitive reflexes. That's how character is built, but that's how we become adult. That's what growing ups do. And uh, as uh, Dr. Larson mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago, using the word perfection, that the, the root of the, the word perfection um, was in being just grown up, being adult, you see? And that's consistent with neuroplasticity, that's consistent with our brains and the develop. But the key thing that gets into a theological discussion, it's not just the Pareto principle, is that the active brain toggles between two systems, the voluntary nervous system and the automatic nervous system. And the automatic nervous system can, constitutes the, the parasympathetic nervous system and the, the sympathetic nervous system. And the brain, in a living brain, is toggling between these all the time. It's how it works. Now, if, for example, they were independent, and I wanted to pursue being perfectionist theologically, uh, I would go talk to my neurosurgeon and my neurobiologist and have them cauterize these basic nuclei and say, I'm done with it. You see, I'm going to stay in this top end of my brain. But the fact is we can't do that because it's so intricately woven. We, we require the automatic and the, uh, and the voluntary systems to be working together all the time. They're active. So you can't do that. So I, I think the top end is not only consistent, the frontal lobe consistent with neuro plasticity, but I'm going to suggest to you, and I've already put some questions out for you, uh, because I won't get to all the questions, I want you to start thinking about them. I think this supports the whole concept of righteousness by faith and, and, and the grace of God, because we can't ever look to suppress those basic primitive t tendencies. They're always there. They were built in from the very beginning, you know, and they're not going to go away. God designed it this way, and if he's got a problem with it, God's got to end it in some way, sometime. Really. And so that gets into, and you'll see in my notes there, are we hybrids? You know, when, I, I'm not sure if it's Mrs. White, or certainly when I grew up as a kid, I was taught that um, man was created less than the angels and higher than the primates. We're tweeners. Humans are tweeners in that sense. <laughs> but what does that really mean? You know, if you put it in a concept of a petri dish, what went into the petri dish? We, we don't know. You can read apocryphal books and some of the, the uh, ancient Mesopotamian literature, uh, and it gives you a much clearer idea of the process. The Bible of Genesis doesn't just give you process or purpose, it just 
tell you what happened. Um, and, and so that gets into uh, another discussion. So now I want to move along um, from the funnel dog. Uh, we did this last week, so I'm going to skip over that. Sorry about being cut off at the top, but this gets into the parietal log. I'm going to take a mouthful of water, and I'm going to give you an exercise. <laughs> I want you to close your eyes, and close your eyes. Just imagine this amphitheater. You can envisage it. You know where some people are sitting. Think about some faces that you would recognize. Think about your handwriting what your signature looks like. Lift your arms up a little bit and move them around. You know where your arms are in space, you know where your body is, and there's no one standing, everyone's sitting. You know where your car is parked out in the, uh, in the car park. You know, open your eyes. You've been living in your parietal lobe. These are all functions of your parietal lobe. And those neurons are firing at a thousand pulses per second, and you've got billions of them doing that. So the parietal log <coughs> is seeing with understanding. That's what perception is. But perception is your reality. I've got my reality. It's based primarily on my perception, which integrates all this incoming sensation. Mm -hmm. But perception becomes our reality. It's dynamic. It's constantly adjusting. It's working all the time. It's not a static thing, but it's primarily known as when I was working as an occupational therapist and we were doing retraining. Here we were working as uh, in the area of spatial relations. Body positioning is what I gave you, but also music. If you can close your eyes and remember a tune, there's some notes of the music, you've gone into your parietal lobe. Uh, very quickly, uh, temporal lobe is about memory and selective listening. Um, and the, uh, I won't go back to the chart, but the temporal lobe is right here behind your ear and above the <coughs> temporal lobe because it's where your temple is, right behind there. And uh, language comprehension is there, speech production is there, but also um, olfactory and smell. It's the only sensation that is actually stored in the temporal lobe. And then we get to the occipital lobe, which is at the back of the brain here, and that is visual interpretation. Uh, and I put there, is seeing, believing. It's also dynamic. It's, it's changing, so seeing is not necessarily believing. And, and if you are, are into any of you that are lawyers, in, in defense lawyers, you know that they're very good at getting people to question what they saw. Uh, trial attorneys know that um, visual memory and what people saw or think they saw is unstable. And they're very good at getting in there and causing people to doubt that what they really saw wasn't what really happened at all. And the part of that opportunity becomes because the brain is readjusting and perception is readjusting all the time. But, uh, but uh, trial attorneys know that, that uh, visual sight, recollection, memory and recollections uh, are untrustworthy uh, unless they are reinforced by uh, what other people say. But a single person's what they saw is not, not trustworthy. <coughs> um, and, and another record for that is the amount of people that give testimony to what they see, and a week later, or two weeks later, want to come back and adjust it. And then another two weeks later, come back. Actually, I remembered something else. I think there was this, you know, this is unstable. So now we go to the anterior association area, which I believe uh, which is in that prefrontal <coughs> lobe area, uh, is, uh, or the pre, uh, what is called the premotor cortex. And this is where planning, and I think I won't repeat myself here, but movement planning, memory, and emotional control is in this area links to the limbic system, the posterior association area. Uh, and it decides the responses, our personality. Now we're getting into some deep brain stuff. And then there's the posterior association area, which sends visual perceptual auditory body uh, sensations to the frontal uh, cortex. It forms our reality, and uh, it also uh, uh, is involved in sending uh, messages back to the body. So you've got all this uh, input coming on, and the brain sorts it reconciles it. If you don't, can't reconcile it, you get this thing called cognitive dissonance. You get a headache or there's some physical manifestation of all this dissonance uh, that's going on in your brain. Uh, and, and that has to be re reconciled in some way. It manifests itself physically, and I'm going to go through that in a minute. But I want to give you just a little anecdote here. It's called Mum Jesus is Coming. Uh, when I was around 12 or 13 years old, my grandfather, we never went to uh, the camp meetings, and my grandfather uh, invited, invited myself and my brother uh, to a camp meeting. And we were really quite excited about that. And during the camp meeting, there were a number of 
uh, of, of uh, uh, sessions that I found really quite emotional, quite challenging, because I was newly exposed to uh, uh, theology. And, uh, and uh, so uh, at the end of the Sabbath, as tip was typical, in uh, end of the week, it was typical in uh, camp meetings, big tent meetings, um, the minister that was in charge uh, uh, gave a very emotional altar call. And he was weepy, and uh, you know, and I was uh, kind of uncomfortable with this. I was only uh, left on the floor. What's going on? He's talking about the end times and how soon Jesus would come. And, and I thought, I, I, I'm not prepared for this. I, I don't really understand this. And I wasn't with any adults. But then people started to go at the front, and then some of my peers started to go at the front. And I, I recognized who some of them were. And I'm thinking, what, 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 what am I supposed to do here? <laughs> and then he made utterances such as, uh, it, it, you know. God, surely the state of the world, he, Jesus has to be here before we can meet again. We, we might as well basically be saying goodbye to each other now. Well, maybe it's two years, I don't know, but surely it can't be three years. It can't be three years. You know, this is 59, 60 years ago now. But it made a big impact on me that something it was dramatic, it was emotional, um, I was deeply concerned about it, about the second coming, and so the next opportunity I got, I went to the bookstore. And I asked the person in charge of the bookstore, I need to re find out whatever I can uh, about, about how do we know when Jesus is coming? Well, I think, I, I know it must have been the year the Bible commentary was released because he showed me this, uh, this assembly of books that had just come in that he's very excited about. And, and I said, my, you know, I think it, I, I make money by trapping rabbits. How many rabbits would I have to catch before <laughs> I do you know, buy the Bible commentary? And then how would I find my way through it? But he came up with a little book, and it must be about three and a half by three and a half inches, a little gray book, I still remember it. But it had all the signs to look for with, with Jesus was coming. And it started with this little black cloud that started kind of in the south. Uh, this is what I need to get hold of. I need to read this because I'm going to get ready for this. I'm going to play it on the front foot, you know, and uh, I'll, I'll be ready. And, but, uh, but I was deeply concerned by it. Well, I went home, and about six to seven weeks later, <coughs> a short time later, um, uh, it was a Sabbath afternoon, and I said, I was out on the veranda of the house, um, and I heard this noise, um, and I couldn't define what the noise was. It was a deep kind of rumbling roar. And, and I stepped out around the corner, and lo and behold, I saw a small black cloud. <laughs> Gosh, could this be? And then I heard this music, like a stereoscopic music coming from the sky up over the valley, and I thought, Jesus is coming. And so I ran inside, and said, Mom, Mom, Jesus is coming. I think Jesus is coming. Deeply concerned, distressed, somewhat semi-distressed. And Mom looked, you know, kind of a little nonchalant, but she came out and she looked, looked around and she said, she said, Rodney, I think that's a tractor over the other side of the hill. <laughs> and she walked back inside. And so I stepped out and I just waited. And then uh, 30 seconds later, a brand new tr diesel tractor, which I had, our tractors were kerosene, I had not powered, I had not heard diesel motor before, was just roaring. He had a, a cab on it that had a stereo, and we had a little <laughs> transistor radio, so I hadn't heard stereo. And the black smoke, these early diesel motors, blew a lot of black smoke, as you know dealers do. But my perception of that was Jesus was coming because I was recently programmed emotionally, reinforced urgency and something dramatic that was stored in my brain. And when I saw that smoke from that tractor before it came over the hill, and my neighbor said, wait, come on, come over here and take a look at my new tractor. She was so proud of it. Was my brain assembled it, and that was my reality. But it wasn't reality at all. It wasn't reality at all. But that's the power of the context of suggestion, probability, emotional context, peer pressure, Blah, blah, blah. All those kind of things were at, uh, at play there. <clears throat> now we come to the emotional brain. I thought I'd give you a picture of this, and I think that they're probably all gone. But if there is a divine human interface in my mind, it has to be here. If you can have a personal relationship, as it were, with God or Jesus, or an agency of God or Jesus, then it has to be here. This is where, this is a system that really presents you to the world as you want to be produ pre uh, uh, introduced or prepared, or as even as others see you. It's going to come through this limbic system here. <coughs> and so, there are four key areas of the limbic system. 
this is sunk, the uh, thalamus up here, and this is the gateway to the cortex. Right. So all incoming information from the autonomic voluntary nerves are going to come up through here, and then they get stored in the brain, and then the brain decides when you want to do something or the body needs something, it will send that stimulation back down and then out to the uh, peripheral nervous system via this thing here that's called the, uh, the, the packs that run in this uh, uh, medulla area here. But, uh, but this is a... Uh, a uh